Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first Say Report of the year 2021. I'm your host, Devin Decker, and before I tell you who's joining me, I want to wish myself a very happy birthday, because we are recording on my birthday. And this is a character voice, and I'm not sure who the character is. Sejin, my host companion, maybe you can tell me. <laughs> it's birthday boy. Hey, birthday boy. Hi! It's my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's your birthday, and it's the beginning of a new year, beginning of uh, new times in, in this country. You're just, you're like baby new year. That's who you are. I'm always birthday, baby, baby new year. New year. <laughs> I get lost. Just like a, a little known fact, uh, R Rudolph shiny new year, that's me. I'm that naked little baby. <laughs> With the big old ears. Yeah, it's gross. It's terrifying. You should see my ears. But he gets lost, and New Year's comes a little late, and that's what happened with me. That's why Happy New Year officially, because it's Devin Decker's birthday. Uh, to quote Australia, because it felt like it was from all of Australia, not Australia. just from Will. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's the most Devinist time of the year. <laughs> Oh man! So like, I have to ask: Did you ever grow into your ears, baby boy? <laughs> uh, you, baby yeah, of boy, course. Baby I mean, New boy. <laughs> baby New Year boy. Hey, or, baby or New Year boy. With you? Uh, yeah, no, I grew into my ears. Uh, they <laughs> fit inside of a uh, a pair of headphones now, which is nice. All right, I'm and here's how we're starting off the show because I'm mad at my computer. Uh, fucking Flash is dead. And I'm yeah. mad at my computer because it's yelling at me that Flash is dead. How dare you still have it installed? And I've had this computer on for like 30 minutes. And it decides two minutes into this episode to like yell at me you, about it. To remind you of the sadness that we all feel deep inside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> Flash is dead, man. Flash is dead. You know what makes me happy, though, is that Stinko Man was finished. And <laughs> come to find out, I ended up beating it twice because you get to fight Stickly Man during the credits. I was just so in awe the first time I finished the game that I let them wash over me like good credits can do. Right, but then yeah. I found out when you beat the game, Stickly Man is there, and if you press the buttons, you can fight against him. You cannot nice. beat him. It's just a for funs fight, which I, I don't like. I don't like that. I don't need like a special victory, but I do want to feel like I beat that son of a bitch. Yeah, and I got to I, eat I'm his a pudding. Fan, though. Of the something to do during credits in the video game sense, especially because video game credits, Jesus, nowadays are like a mile long. Back in my day, um, but like, like the the carrot and stick of of like, here's something to do while you watch all the credits. Also, please watch our credits all the way to the end because we work so hard on this game. Like that, th those that feels rewarding as a as a somebody that played through a game, you know. Um, I'm trying to think of like some really good ones like uh what's the one where you can slam down through oh uh, Rayman uh the the Rayman um legends from a, not legends okay. the, the one before that uh Rayman Origins um there's this really phenomenal like like thing that you can do during the credits of just slamming down through the credits and collecting looms and all this shit and it's uh it's just super fun and, and I remember like having a blast doing that like two o'clock in the morning after playing through that game um yeah it's like that that's always appreciated as a as an audience member. I think one of my favorite ones is when you get to shoot the credits, where, like, you, you're you a ship and you shoot the credits. Because I feel like I actually am reading the credits as well. Because yeah, sometimes yeah. I feel that, like, a credit Easter egg like that, like, extra game during the credits, is a distraction from the credits. And I have been, like terribly pavlonian conditioned to like the credits are my reward and it has my full attention so mm -hmm. like there's that little bit of me that's like i don't want to do anything else during these credits i just want to let them roll especially because for me i've probably been playing for like two three hours and like a forced break to read that's good that's a good <laughs> thing to have <laughs> yeah yeah I think it's probably for the majority of people out there who usually do things like skip the credits is generally what they, that is there for. But yeah, I get what you're saying. I mean, I got I no, you're not wrong. I have to tell you, the credits for Miles Morales, Spider-Man Miles Morales, was like a solid 45 minutes, and I sat mm -hmm. there and I watched all of them, and I'm like, and I'm fine with that. Like that's something that I wanted to do, but like yeah. as it creeped past the 30 minute mark, 
I, I did like, wow, these, this is a lot, a lot of people work on video games and it's very disappointing that a lot of people also work on cinematic experiences, not just video game experiences, but the credits for cinema, like those people probably have a job in the video game industry. There's no guarantee of that. Because if that's the people that you're seeing listed for a like, job, or that might be they might have lost that job as soon as that game got released. Yeah, yeah. Like it's 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 strange that way, because they're not unionized. A lot of the people working on your favorite movies, they're unionized. This is a union speech, I guess, in the first episode of 2021. But as COVID continues to surge, as it is 2021, and we're still dealing with that unwanted relative from 2019, COVID 19. Mm -hmm. um, productions are shutting down in Hollywood. And I mean, I think that's the right thing to do. I think that, I mean, so far I only know that that's ABC, 20th Century Fox and Disney plus stuff that's taking a hiatus, but I think it's the right thing to do. And those people, because they're in a union, their jobs are kind of sort of protected. But the reason why so much gets done against the working man in the video game industry is because they don't have that luxury. Like they are just chattel to be whipped to exhaustion and then replaced with a fresh batch. <laughs> yeah, man, <laughs> we're getting deep into 2021 already. Let's, let's, well, let's I don't know. You know things. what? You know what? This episode, this episode is a slight sequel to an, another episode in the say report it released in March of 2019, 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 2019. It released in 2019. It's so weird that it's 2021 and that, like, I have to shift my mind back two years. It's the worst part about being Baby New Year is that, like, you have to... <laughs> Time is irrelevant to Baby New Year. <laughs> it's, it's just a fact of the matter. Um <laughs> Uh, but in 2019, uh, I played a little game, and that game inspired me to name an episode, Devin May Cry. And the episode that you're currently listening to is Devin May Cry 2. Now, of course, it's because Devil May Cry 5 is it's going to crop into this episode, but also it's my birthday, and I may cry if I may want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, this oh, is man. certainly a situation where, like, I wasn't prepared for the, the thoughts of crying, but... There were some games that I needed to finish during yeah. our dipsalicious vacation away from recording. I hope you mm -hmm. all enjoyed the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles episode that we bestowed upon you last week. Uh, I know I did. I, I've listened also to it a very twice. Special episode yeah. that we dropped in the middle of all of this. Two, yeah. two of very, very choice episodes for us. Yes. Um, but yeah, so just like going back and, and looking at that and all that, uh, I, there were some things I needed to complete. So I've watched just a ton of video game credits lately and apparently I, it gave me some thoughts on on that whole situation <laughs> and and, and oh, thoughts man. that i'm not sorry for at all but like hyrule warriors definitive edition on hmm? nintendo switch have you played it have you played have you played that game through to the end uh what is the end yeah like, like, right through, there's through, a question through the story mode at least yes legend through, mode legend through, mode yeah through to the final final decisive battle yes, yes. which like that got on my nerves i have not <laughs> felt so cock blocked by a piece of entertainment since lord of the rings the return of the king with false endings <laughs> like six different endings oh for this God, game. Yeah. Well, and 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 the the real issue is that before the fight, you watched the cutscene because it that's where you get the story in a Warriors game, and the last word before the mission is this would be the final decisive battle. So I'm like, right. oh, I got to be done. This needs to be the last one. Maybe there'll be like a Linkle mission that opens up after it, but this feels right. like the end of the game. And nope, you gotta do and the then, entire villain run. Nope, you get to be a bad guy. And then at the end of that bad guy's run, the narrator, this would be the final decisive battle. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, you know what? That's cool. I got to walk a mile in her moccasins, understand this character a little bit more. And then I after that... that Japan does not know what the word final means, considering it's misuse in many a video game franchise. <laughs> you know what? Actually, I don't blame... 
it's strange because I went on a deep dive on Hyrule Warriors and mm. for the Switch version, that original final decisive battle was the final decisive battle. And that, I mean, not Switch, the Wii U version, because this game started right. on Wii U. Right. Yeah. Um, and then they added DLC. And because this is the definitive edition, all of that DLC is included. The difference being that when the DLC was part of the Wii U game, you could play it in any order that you wanted to. So, like, you could sort of see the heroes uh, and the villains' perspective parallel to being the hero, which right. that seems like good narrative. Like, that, that's a fun narrative to, like, step into the bad guy's shoes. I mean, that's what Warriors games tend to do anyway before yeah, it, DLC. It, 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 <laughs> It's a little disjointing going back to playing like fucking Ganon, especially if you've leveled him up like crazy, and like you you go you jump into those early levels with him, and you just I mean on the one hand it's nice because you just fucking own as Ganon, which I guess you kind of should, right? Yeah, um, and that's but, the whole uh, point of the character. Yeah, it gets but... a, it does get a little weird though going back to those early episodes and just like sweeping through them. Like that was clearly not the intent for for a lot of those early levels. Uh, but the the real just fuck you moment for for Hyrule Warriors is all right. I've played as all the characters that I know, the final decisive battle as Ganon this time. Let uh, no against Ganon be Ganondorf becoming Ganon the pig monster this time. <laughs> this has to be yep. the end of it. This has there, there can't be any more from this moment. And then oh no, Wind Waker showed up. Yep. <laughs> Here's four Wind Waker levels. That yep. just exist, and it's just... <laughs> I, I thought I was done three final decisive battles ago. Oh my but God, I want it so to be done. It's and, it, and I don't want you to think I'm complaining about the content. But for me, that game was not going to be over until credits rolled. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to finish that game before I started one of the gifts I got for Christmas, Age of Calamity. Because <sighs> I knew that if I moved on... I was probably never going back to Definitive Edition. Did you, uh... How, mm, okay, so did you start Age of Calamity? I have not started Age of Calamity yet. Uh, I wanted to... Be ready for... I don't know the best way to put this. It's a little breakneck what a difference. <laughs> like, like there's a... It's not the same game. It's it's really it's really really hard for me to talk about it. It, it. Like I think in a lot of ways, I think the best way to describe it is I think a lot of people were maybe expecting DLC for the first game and they were surprised that it was its own game. The second you start playing it, you realize why it's its own game. I, I certainly hope what I what I honestly hope for the whole experience of Age of Calamity is that stuff that Koei Tecmo learned from. Fire Emblem Warriors, which came out like two years after Hyrule Warriors, has yeah. been incorporated into it. You'll because, have to tell me if that's the case, because yeah. I haven't touched Fire Emblem yet, but I'm really interested to after playing Age of Calamity, because there is there there's some it's not that there's quality of life improvements or even like stuff that that really upsets me. It, it clearly it makes sense within the context of the game, but as somebody that was going in expecting it to be more Hyrule Warriors, it's not. And I think that's one of the biggest things that surprises me, considering it was very much riding on the coattails of the success of Hyrule Warriors to to be willing to basically say, yeah, but this is its own game was what this what it needed in order to justify its full price price tag as its own game and not just DLC, but also at the same time was a little bit like like jarring for me. And I don't I don't doubt that for a second, because going from Fire Emblem Warriors back to Hyrule Warriors mm -hmm. felt like such a step in the wrong direction. Yeah. And it's so I can imagine that this game, I mean, the and I feel like Hyrule Warriors, the original one, finally figured out what the game should be in the final level of the Wind Waker DLC, where <laughs> you have to play as every character you are not able to just run around as one character who's very strong. You are forced to switch between characters because you, you are stuck in four separate areas of the final battlefield. And yeah. if you count on the I, CPU to do it, it's it's not going to do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. As somebody that played that through that... Um... Uh, multiplayer like that that's the way I got through that game it felt it, it felt very much like it was meant for multiplayer in the end because we could jump between two or three characters each as opposed to six characters for one person um yeah, yeah no so yeah. there's there's that 
um, the other thing that I want, I feel like we, we're, we're being a little disingenuous by not pointing out that the quote-unquote legends mode of Hyrule Warriors is to be to be generous is 30% of that game. I feel like it's even more like 20% or maybe even 15% of that game because there's like three other modes, four other modes of that game that get so much deeper into like unlocking other characters and like and other uh, and other styles of play and the challenge modes and all that shit and not to mention all of the weird shit that goes on in that game as far as like fairies and and feeding swords and shit like that like there's there's a whole bunch of other shit that goes on in this game that you never have to touch in the legends mode if you don't want to and like i get the idea of playing from beginning to end and seeing credits roll and you calling it the game because i anybody that remembers what i said a few months back about the game that was exactly where i said i felt like i had quote unquote finished it was the second i saw credits come down the screen and so like i i am totally with you on that but there's there's something to be said about the fact that as much as we're talking about how this thing seemed to never end you're also only talking about one fifth of the entire freaking thing on that on that little tiny cartridge that goes into the back of that switch <laughs> right and that's where like fire emblem warriors it forced me to like explore and be other characters it didn't just allow me to be the new character that was made for the game and then by the time I got to the end of it, I felt compelled to go into those other modes and explore what that one had to offer. Yeah. But Legends mode, just the way that it's built, didn't inspire me to do any of the other stuff. No, I, you, you could totally be forgiven for never touching anything else in that game. If you were like, oh yeah, I played that. I played the this the story and I saw this, this, and this. And like, I would never question that. And as I said, like totally with you on board saying that like the second credits roll on that Legends mode, I am considering that game done. Like, I love that there's more stuff I can go and do in it and I have a hell of a time doing it. But I don't feel nearly as like compelled to sit down and put hours into that game like, like me and, and Hannah did when we first started playing that game together. Right. And I hope that that's not the case with Age of Calamity. And I feel like that wasn't the case with Fire Emblem. So my fingers are crossed and I'm excited to start it. But I also had to finish Demon's Souls because I wanted to come in the first episode of 2021 and my birthday say I completed Demon's Souls. I haven't gotten the Platinum yet, but I did do New Game, right? I'm in New Game Plus right now. Nice, and that man. felt pretty good. It felt really good that like after Hyrule Warriors, I'm like, I'm not going to bed till I'm done with Demon's Souls. And I was still able to finish last night before the, the turnover into a new day, before Zero Dark. So I that am, felt pretty cool. <laughs> I am slowly starting to come around to Bloodborne. Right, like I as a as I play more and more like roguelites, and the idea of like death does not scare the crap out of me as much as it did when when these Souls games first started a decade ago. Like, I am slowly starting to come around on on specifically Bloodborne is the one that's really kind of hooking me at the moment. Is Demon Souls worth me checking out yet, or should I like give it some time until I'm like into these games? Uh, Demon Souls is what made everyone fall in love with these games. As much as people give the credit to Dark Souls, mm -hmm. Demon Souls, and this is going to sound ridiculous, and I understand that it's going to sound ridiculous, is sort of the tutorial to the whole thing. And that's how I felt playing through it again, was, all right, I know this stuff. Like, even though I played through this game in 104 days to get the Platinum, and I had finished it, like, you know, halfway through that, and then just focused on Platinum stuff, um, Demon's Souls is very user-friendly in a way that Bloodborne is not. Okay. Bloodborne is a much bigger world, so exploring it is strange. Demon's Souls, because everything is sort of, like, tied up in these nice little digestible packages, it teaches you how to play that type of game. And I remember the moment where I'm like, it doesn't matter that I just lost my souls. It doesn't matter that that just happened because mm. I'm I'm going to be playing through this level, you know, 15, 20 more times. I'll get those souls back just in killing stuff and getting better at the game. Okay. And then that mentality for me, specifically for me, is what I brought forward into Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3. So if you're finding your way and feeling the groove of Bloodborne... 
uh, you could probably play any of them at this point. Okay. And um, Demon Souls, I think, would be the most enjoyable because it will only service to strengthen your steel of that in that type of game, as opposed to deter you in the beginning. Okay. Yeah, it, it's it's something that I, I've really tried really hard to come to terms with as a as a gamer the idea that that like not that death doesn't matter but that death is not the end right and and uh it's funny because like it, in all of this like retrospective stuff about gaming that you did while we were on break the big thing that i did was i got a mario um mario 3d all-stars mm -hmm. and uh one of the big things that is going on in that i don't remember if this is true of the original mario or not uh, mario 64 or not can't save your lives Nope. If you <laughs> can't do it, that's why can't you gotta get 120 stars so that yeah. Yoshi fills it up for you. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, so I say, so like went on like a huge thing the other day because we were, uh, we were doing one of the weird, um, one of the weird platformy ones that just kind of wasn't quite working for us. Right. So we went and we farmed maybe 30 lives, like, like, and that's being conservative. It was probably closer to 50, but like we did that. Um, then got through it, and we still had, like, 30-something lives left, and so we were just like, oh, this is a good place to stop. That was really pissing us off, and when we come back, we'll have 30 lives, and we can bang on through some other stuff. Came on back to three lives. It was a little disheartening. Um, not, like, not like game-breakingly bad or anything like that. It was just like, oh, that's a bit of a freaking bummer that we went through all of that time. Um, uh, and, like... I mean, you could just put the system to sleep and not play any other games. <laughs> like that, there's a modern solution to your old timey problem. Yeah, I mean that's not going to happen when three people are using the no, same switch to do that. things. There's like, a reason like why I think there are five switches in this house at last <laughs> count for that exact yeah. reason. That like, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm in the middle of a game on that one. You, I'll play it on this one. And yeah, like it's, and you know, it, it just happens, and it's because like things have gotten damaged. And as we talked about when the switch came out, God three years ago now, uh, four years ago, come March of this year, like, buying replacement stuff is almost fiscally irresponsible when you yeah. consider the fact that, you know, Joy-Cons are ha almost half the price of a new system. Yeah. So Yeah, man. <laughs> Um, I, I mean, like, as somebody that's staring down the barrel of trying to figure out, like, what to, to, to do about a new console, like, one of my options is legitimately to buy my own Switch. Like, I, I'm looking at, like, do I invest in the, the Microsoft payment plan? Do I save up for a PS5 and, like, go whole hog? Or, like, do I just get a Switch and buy a bunch of games I know I want for myself? Um, like, it, it, it is interesting to me how legitimate of a consideration that is in that conversation right well especially when you consider the fact that for the price of an xbox series system not a series s but a series x and if you're serious about playing games which i believe that both of us are this isn't a gaming podcast but it's part of the everything that we cover uh you can get two nintendo switches yes and that doesn't sound crazy because then you have four joy cons which will cover you for any party game that you might play you'll have two docks which means that you can have two locations to drop it in and just Either keep one. playing drop both of them yeah, yeah they're, exactly they're interchangeable no, but, docks. but yeah, yeah but that's yeah. what i'm saying you have that and you can have a home switch and an away switch mm -hmm. like the pricing on it the, what they did with that the only thing that i will say since at least two of the switches that are in this house are switch lights don't bother with the switch light. We have a switch light in this house, and we and we love it. Like the switch light is great as a companion to the switch. I if, I I think if it was the only one in this house, we'd be a little less excited about it. But the fact that it is a companion to the main system, uh, we we love the darn the darn thing. Um, right, right, and that's but that's the thing. But I'm talking specifically of your situation. Yeah, spend the extra hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. get no, another go for the proper one. one. Um, you know the uh, the big contender with Xbox for me, like the thing. This is gonna sound so stupid compared to everything else. It is the fact that I I don't know why I didn't consider this, but on the Xbox uh, the Game Pass, 
one of the games available to you is the the rare collection that they put out uh, probably two three years ago at this point with Banjo Kazooie, Banjo Tooie, and Conquer, as well as like thirty a bunch other, of games. other stuff. Jetpack, yeah, yeah. Battle Toads, Jet Force Gemini, Battle yeah. Toads, the arcade game. Like that game alone is make that that collection of games alone is making me seriously consider the idea of going in on the payment plan for the Microsoft Xbox. Back when I owned an Xbox One, because there was a time where I had an Xbox One, uh, that was one of the only games that I owned. Mm -hmm. I owned that, a used copy of Master Chief Collection, and Sunset nice. Overdrive that I think is still sealed. I don't think I ever ripped the plastic on that. Uh, Sunset Overdrive is the only other thing that I'm like, also, I always wanted to check out Sunset Overdrive. Now, this is coming from somebody that's been playing a fuck ton of Tony Hawk over the last two weeks, but and we'll talk about that in a second. But, like, all of my gaming has been fucking Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 and Mario 64 and Mario Sunshine. I haven't even touched Mario Galaxy yet. I touched it for, like, a hot second just so I could meet Rosalina and see what she looked like on my 4K TV. Like, that was the that was legitimately the, all I've done with, with Galaxy. Yeah, it's, um... Yeah, nostalgia is a real thing, right? Yeah. If anything that 2020 proved, a thesis statement of this show is that nostalgia okay. is a real thing. You've done it, Devin. You've you've summoned it. You've hit three different things about this the thing that I wanted to talk about. And like Beetlejuice, it is now going to rise up in front of you because we need to talk about that. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm all about it. Sign Here's how we're up. starting 2021, Devin. This is a, this is, is it 2021? <laughs> We are. This is how we're starting 2021, Devin. Do you know how we're starting 2021? Oh my God, no! I'm so scared. <laughs> we're beating Tim the Two Man Taylor again. <laughs> I haven't seen the episode yet, oh, and I'm it's so happening. upset. I know that it's coming. I know that for some reason, Last Man Standing, uh, uh, Mike Baxter is going to meet Tim the Tool Man Taylor because it's been in all the promos. But I yeah. switch away as fast as I can. So I think the reason why you may not have seen it yet is I'm pretty sure that the – so this is part of the – there's some confusing marketing on this. But Tim the Toolman Taylor is going to be on Last Man Standing somehow. And I think he's going to show up in, in what, is, what they are calling a time period episode in which they're going to go through various time periods in Mike Baxter's life. Um, and supposedly that doesn't air to the 7th, and we record on Mondays. So the, the season premiere was yesterday. This premiere will be later this week. That actually checks and tracks real gross. Because remember, we talked about all these shows that started their new seasons. Uh -huh. And they started it with a finale episode. Like yes. Young Sheldon's season 4 episode 1 is really season 3 episode 22. Yeah. Uh, officially, Last Man Standing had an unproduced episode. That, like... Is By all accounts, episode. like he was all about. Uh, I can't think of his name. I want to call him Tim Taylor. Tim, Tim Allen. Allen. Yeah, his name's <laughs> Tim. I was halfway there, living on a prayer. Um, Tim Allen was so proud of it that he said this episode is still going to be produced, even though we've decided to go in a bit of a different direction, knowing that season nine is our last season. Yeah, I mean, so season nine is going to be uh, essentially their fuck it season from all this reading that I'm seeing. It's <laughs> I basically mean... they're like, like, look, we got this season. We we probably didn't even deserve it, but we got it. So we're just going to do what we want this season until they tell us to to <laughs> to get off the fucking air and they'll pull the rest up on I'm Hulu. pretty sure they're not going to get magic powers or the Great Kazoo's not going to show up. I don't think those things are going to happen. That's what no, I always think Tim of. Tim Allen is going to meet Tim Allen and they're going to shake hands on screen. I... Like, you can say that, oh, that weird stuff's not going to happen, but something weird definitely is. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's going to be like a Christmas Carol thing and Tim Taylor is going to be like the ghost of Christmas that could have happened. I mean, you say that, and then that means that they supposedly go bring in the Santa Claus. <laughs> yeah, they really could. I mean, here's the thing about Last Man Standing, because the early seasons have been on on like CMT and Ion Television, all mm -hmm. of these stations that my father watches, and I've been home that, a lot more don't lately. Get the irony of the comedy of that show, much yeah. like Tim Allen himself. But anyway, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and it is chock a block full of like kids coming to the door. One of them's dressed as Buzz Lightyear, and one of them's dressed as the Lion King. And Tim Allen gives Buzz Lightyear more more candy and doesn't give a lot to Simba. And inexplicably, Jonathan Taylor Thomas is in that episode as Kristen's manager at the restaurant. And he's like, you know what? I'm a big fan of Simba, so I'll give you some candy. 
<laughs> and it's just like, <laughs> oh god, it's like it, it's like a fucking '90s TV Ouroboros. <laughs> it's so <laughs> it's like it's it's fantastic. When they changed from ABC to Fox, the yeah. first episode was Kyle, who's like Mandy's husband now. He's he's yeah. like a guy that Tim worked with, uh, Mike Baxter worked with at Outdoor Man. It was like, oh man, I forgot to tape my show, but that's weird. It's not on the network. That, that is usually on. It's not airing. Why would they cancel a popular show? And then, you know, Tim Allen walks in. He's like, have you tried other networks? And he's like, they don't move networks of TV shows. And he's like, sometimes they do when they're performing really well and have a dedicated fan base. And the original network doesn't know how good they had it with that show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, man. Like, it. that show is is a master class in like meta. So it's not surprising to me that in bringing it to a close, Tim Allen would want to revisit the character that put him on the television, like map. I will say this about last man standing. If you've got the stomach for, for 90 sitcoms, if you're the kind of person that can sit back and watch some home improvement or, or like, I mean, I would even push this into like the full house of uh, fresh Prince, like wheelhouse. If you can go back and watch that kind of stuff and you, and like you enjoy that, you should try last man standing because I think anything that you could levy against that show, including the fact that Tim Allen has revealed himself to be a conservative jackass, right? Any of that, you could apply to the same criticism of any of those '90s shows, and we seem to fucking love those. So, like, like it's it, there's there's a conversation and an argument to be had about not giving Last Man Standing your time. And anybody out there that says they don't want to bother with it, I respect, and you are allowed to do that. I'm just gonna say this: I've never seen an episode of that show that didn't at least make me feel like I was back at home with my mom and dad watching TV on Thursday nights after Boy Scouts. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, I, like. I do. I, like no Boy Scouts, but definitely. I mean, it's a show that I enjoy watching with my mother and father. And, mm -hmm. you know, based on everything that you said, it, it makes perfect sense why Dale doesn't enjoy it. Because mm -hmm. television for Dale, by the time she was watching TV with us, was like How I Met Your Mother and The Office and Big Bang Theory. And those shows were like Chuck Lorre kind of being like, I don't want to do sitcoms like we used to do them. Yeah, yeah. Chuck Lorre that... being like, look, I've got the chops, but, like, we're going to still evolve. And and he did. Like, for, for for all of the crap that you want to give something like How I Met Your Mother or, like, or or even um, Modern Family and things like that, but, like, like, they... They are definitely evolutions of the sitcom. I know they fall into a lot of the same traps that sitcoms used to, and we and we look back on them and cringe a bit. But like, there are still people out there that still put on fucking how I met me, how I met your mother to fall asleep every night. You know what I mean? Just like Friends and just like Fresh Prince and just like I mean, even going back, All in the Family, like like Sanford and Son. Like there are people out there that fucking love like that shit, despite all of its uh its its ugliness and its warts. And and maybe that's what 2021 is all about. Maybe that's what I'm saying with this last man standing cross crossover episode reminding us of where Tim Allen came from is that like you know we've realized over the last year that like there's a lot of warts on this thing that we call America <laughs> but we love it anyway also remember that Tim Allen served time for selling cocaine like that's mm -hmm. the thing that people don't remember a lot yeah but yeah went to prison motherfucker yeah, went to prison went to prison and then was still in big trouble mm -hmm. and with Patrick and I mean, like, and that's the thing is like, like, there's plenty of people out there that we are willing to ignore the bullshit on. I mean, like, look at everything with like Tom Cruise in his life, and the fact that we still want to go and see Tom Cruise fly himself into space to make a movie. Like, we're willing <laughs> to put up with that shit, but like, like, I look, I'm not gonna sit here and defend anybody. Like anybody out there that wants to say I can't ever watch another Johnny Depp movie again, you totally earn the right to do that. I, I, I hate it whenever somebody says something like that and the first thing they get called out on is fucking like cancel culture bullshit. It's like, no, you have the right to decide what to do with your own time. And so if you don't want ever want to watch anything with Tim Allen ever again, like that's cool. Pixar seems to agree with you, hence why it's gonna be fucking Chris uh, <laughs> Chris Evans. No, in the new no, I movie. get it. I understand why they're changing it. 
because yeah, that's yeah. the real Buzz Lightyear. <laughs> that's the real but, Buzz Lightyear, CJ. That, that's true. And, so, like, like there, and, there's, and there is an artistic conversation to be had there for sure. But let's not, to, let's not deny the Disney exec reason. The reason that you tell him you're not going to bring Tim Allen back in is because Tim Allen don't sell no more. Like, and, like that's clearly part of it, right? Like, oh, it's like, also connected to Last Man Standing. Let's right, not right. pretend that it's not. Let's not he pretend that... everybody at Disney and like... And like yeah, yeah, yeah. Disney canceled him after the sixth season... And then his first episode back on television was a huge shot across the bow as he was recording Buzz but Lightyear in Toy Story 4. I was going to say Toy Story 4 <laughs> was, was still kind of in process, so yeah. But um, but that's what I mean. It's like anybody out there that wants to like take a fucking stand and say, like, I've only got limited time on this earth and I do not want to fucking spend it on Tim Allen, more power to you. But anybody out there that has the ability to like stomach some of that shit and be like, I just need something to shut my mind off for an hour. Watch a couple episodes of Last Man Standing. Yeah, it's worth checking out. And especially going back, it, it's it got some good stuff. I forgot how good it was in its second season. And it's better than Kevin Can Wait, who decided to kill off the wife uh, on a whim just to semi-reboot King of Queens oh. in its second season. Fucking for sure. Yes, man. I mean, Last Man Standing, I mean, for, like, just to give you a taste of what that show is, the very first episode deals with the fact that his oldest daughter mm -hmm. wants to join the football team, and, like, and no, it is... No, 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 that's, that's not until season two. No, the... that's definitely... I've only ever watched one full episode of Last Man Standing before I got into it over break, and it was that episode. Okay. I may be mistaken. So, I think it's his youngest daughter, not his oldest, because his oldest daughter in the first okay. one... Well, he's trying to set up Mandy, his middle child, with Kyle, but when Kyle comes over, he meets the oldest and thinks that that's the one that he's trying to set him up with, and they begin dating for the first season, and then it's weird because in the second season and going forward, you're supposed to just kind of forget that Kyle and Kristen dated for an entire year three years ago because there's a time jump between the first and second season. Mm -hmm, and right, now Kyle yes. is happily dating Kristen's younger sister, Mandy. And, like, <laughs> Eskimo siblings within the own family, that's something that I've always had a bit of an issue with. I mean, it happens for it, sure. I'm though. sure it happens. And when it's addressed, it's much better. But, like... Yeah. But yeah, no, but but the very first episode deals with him having to like like swallow his pride as a man and his daughter wanting to play a sport, right? And what's really interesting to me is how it, that evolves into like a, a show that conservatives like to watch. Like, so it's really interesting to me to watch that show. And, and that's just like one episode, right? Every episode seems to be this thing of this like conservative old white dude having to deal with the fact that like he, his, his opinions and thoughts and ideas are maybe... Uh, not fully informed and yet that is like what is considered like conservative sitcom fodder now for Fox I love it I just it's, love it yeah it's nuts because like and it's also that he is clearly a conservative but that mm -hmm. doesn't mean that he's a Trump supporter oh no, no that's no, like no, no, no. that's like it's this weird middle ground I mean, that, the show started in 2011, so right. like we're talking, we're talking about a full five years before the idea of even the Tea Party was really like formulated in the brains of anybody there, right? Like, like he, no, he is very much in the idea of just like old school Republican. I guess would be maybe the better way of saying it. He's Stan Smith, but real. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. because yeah. they haven't done it, and I completely understand why you now that it's on TBS and it's not on Fox why you shy away from doing a Trump episode. It disappoints me that in all of the episodes of American Dad we got over the past two years, like there was that that long time, it was like 72 weeks where there was an, always a new episode of American Dad on Monday night. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. that they didn't broach the whole Trump issue is so strange yeah. to me when you consider that, you know, George W. Bush was in an episode in the early years. Barack Obama was in an episode in the early years. Like it was one of those things that they didn't shy away from the yeah, fact that I, as a CIA man, the stand has to deal with, with this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Like I, I agree with that. I will say this. I think that it really is one of those things of just like, like flash in the pan, not wanting to give him any time of day type of thing. Like I think in, in, I think that, Another way to look at it is that the fact that they never paid attention to him is in and of itself a statement. You know what I mean? Like, that, and that's, 
that that's me clearly speaking for them and I don't know how they feel about it but like but but the fact that they were willing to talk about the shit going on with Bush the fact that they were willing to talk about the stuff going on with Obama and in the little that they did really kind of talk about some of the really actually conservative stuff that Obama did like and that, that that's not the thing that they focus on like the idea that that they are making a thing that is that is both like timely and timeless and they're really good at that and I feel like the entirety of the last four years people just are still not going to believe for years to come. Like it, it, it's just, it still feels like we're living in a lifetime movie as opposed to real life. And, you know, maybe, maybe they'll do something once we've all kind of like collectively dealt with what the fuck the last four years were. I don't know. As somebody who's seen the weird remnants of Trump in entertainment over 2020, like the episode of designing women where they, they have his phone number and they want to call him, and then Julia Sugarbaker tells him off. In Home Alone like Two, which 91. I watched over Christmas. Yeah, what's that? Home Alone Two, which Home I watched Alone over two. Christmas. Dude, when he um, like goes into the store and like Trump like gives him like a fucking like fiver to get the fuck out of his store or whatever that it's, moment it's is. It's Hilton. It's in it's the it's, the yeah, lobby yeah, yeah. of the Hilton Hotel, or maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. And he asks him for directions, and he just gives him money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's Trump Tower. I'm pretty sure it's Trump Plaza. Like he let them shoot there. So if he could be in the movie, I think that's yeah. how that story also, goes. He needed some money to keep that thing afloat for about two <laughs> yeah, more years. A couple, yeah, a yeah. couple of months, right? <laughs> um, but then also like roller games, they showed the entirety of roller games on Christmas on Fox Sports 2. And the first episode of roller games, they're like, what's going to happen next? Donald Trump becomes president. And it's like, that's weird. That's weird that they said that in this 1990s fake wrestling inspired roller derby competition show the uh season 11 episode of simpsons where bart uh, at the indian casino like looks into the future like we've been watching a ton of simpsons lately yeah. but there's that there's a there's a good like joke and a half about like trump becoming president and ruining the economy so lisa has to fix it like is the is the, yep. like, the, the joke in the future yeah man like there's a ton and of that even american movie. dad in their the second episode stan says and you were fired and Donald Trump shows up and he goes, I didn't say you're fired. So I don't owe you any money, Mr. Trump. And it's just one of those situations where like, you know, you I'm know really what? glad it, that you didn't yeah. revisit this character. That you was in did an episode. Take a, a swing at Trump in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I just rewatched the episode of the new Animaniacs where they redo the Odyssey and Trump is the uh, the Cyclops and it is pretty fucking choice. <laughs> I don't like the new Animaniacs. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. You could probably find the bit on YouTube. Oh yeah, totally no. worth everybody was sharing um, it around. So yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, I could also just jump to it, right? You know what I'd like to talk about before we end this nostalgia fest on old TV. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We currently have CBS All Access again because there was an issue with an episode of Magnum PI, the premiere episode of Magnum PI, like 10 minutes of it was just the black screen. So I'm like, I'll pay $10 and just watch it on CBS All Access and also experience CBS All Access again for a month. Man, and for a hot second, I thought you meant they gave it to you free because they fucked something up. No. But you went out of your way to pay money because of 10 minutes being blank screen on television. I would have been that old man calling in and being like, I demand well, that you re-air. The thing is that I could have put it on demand, right? I have on demand. I could have watched it there and it would have been fine. But you can't fast forward on demand. And it was like 10 minutes at the 40 minute mark of the episode you man the fucking formula worked they figured it out they didn't they didn't get me you know why it happened it happened because will asked me if i knew anything about star trek below uh lower decks and i said no and then later on that same day so unless will is a plant from the paramount corporation to try Which to get ten dollars from me and you're not wrong he, he definitely could be um i'm like all right so we'll get to watch the magnum and the day can continue on on, there's no problem in the middle of this day and I'll finally check out an episode of Lower Decks of Star Trek win-win that is worth ten dollars for the record Lower Decks pretty rad but you guys should watch Final Space to get some pointers just gonna say that anyway keep going uh, I, I I enjoy Final Space the episodes that I've seen but I can't I can't just sit and watch it the way that I watch other shows I'm Shame. not sure what it is about that I should give it a try though now that I'm sure it's streaming somewhere Mm -hmm. Um, 
But yeah, but with CBS All Access, we got I Love Lucy. I fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah and we're man. like, let's watch an episode of I Love Lucy. Or that's all just of them. that's just fun and funny and nothing bad's going to happen. So the first 3 episodes of I Love Lucy, they are not available on streaming. But the oh. fourth episode, that's where it starts. It starts with season 1 episode 4 of I Love Lucy, the title of which is and and I'm not kidding here, Lucy thinks Ricky is trying to kill her. That's the title of the fourth episode of I Love Lucy. And in it, Lucy is reading a mystery novel. <laughs> and she, as Ricky's trying to go to sleep, she's sitting in bed saying, like, now I wonder who killed him. It, who killed her? It could have been this person. It could have been that person. It could have been this person. And Ricky, he's just worked a night out at the club, right? Playing his bongos or whatever he does in the band. I thought he was the singer. But he's the band. Yeah, he's, he's the band, the band leader. leader. <laughs> So he's tired. He's he's understandably tired coming in at two in the morning. So he says like jokingly that he bet it he bet it was her husband. And Lucy like looks at him and he's like, Yeah, there's a bunch of ways. He could shoot her, he could stab her, that'd be loud though. He could just take a scarf and choke her out. Well, good night, honey. So then Lucy, because she's Lucy, thinks that Ricky's trying to kill her. And, you know, farcical things happen where like He's told by his manager that he needs to replace the, the girl singer in the band because they've been having some issues with her. And she hears him on the phone saying, don't worry, I'll get rid of her and we'll find a new one in like a day. So Lucy's like, oh, my God, he's trying to kill me. Oh, my God. <laughs> so so she like says to him, ah, I'm afraid of you. And she runs away. And then Fred, which like if I lived in an, a rented apartment and my landlord just wandered into my apartment. First of all, the fact that Fred and Ricky are friends, that has never truly jived with me. <laughs> uh, like, they weren't friends before. It's no, weird. It's, it's, it, is a, it is an entirely manufactured, like, thing, like, the, like... It, of the idea of the the fun landlord it is something that we saw a lot in those days i mean like look at anything on three's company but like the the idea of like the landlord that like knew you personally and like understood your situation and was willing to work with you on things like oh say like oh this month's been a little hard so why don't you hold off on rent until next week when that big win comes in like that is entirely fucking manufactured for for the 60s and 70s of television i think in i love lucy it would be just next time you go to Hawaii, take me and my wife along. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. It's, it's weird. Their relationship is weird. So he comes strolling in and he's like, what's going on, Rick? And he's like, I don't know. Lucy's going crazy and I need to be at the club. And Fred, no word of a lie, goes, why don't you slip her a Mickey? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man, the good old days. <laughs> and I'm just like... <laughs> And it was one of those record scratch moments in the house. Like, did did Fred just tell Ricky to drug his wife <laughs> because she's acting hysterical? Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and he's like, no, I couldn't do that. And he's like, no, nah, it's fine. I got one right here. And he pulls out powder. He doesn't have, like, he has powder. And he's like, just mix it with some soda water. And then she'll be knocked out. And I'll check on her every half hour make sure she's okay. Which, yeah, like every Christmas, I have to deal with people saying, well, what's in this drink is really just a metaphor for, like, alcohol not being allowed because it was prohibition and all this shit. It's like, no, they talk about drugs, yo. And they're like, nah, 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 nah. But look at this shit. When this they, he literally pulls out a bag of powder. He to pulls pour out a bag drink. of powder to pour into it. And he's like, I do it to Ethel all the time. <laughs> and I'm just like, <laughs> and then Ricky, like, agrees. <laughs> And For I'm the just record, like, I'm not laughing because the situation is funny. I'm laughing because I cannot believe this was a thing that aired on television in America. All right? It's just one of those situations where, like, things have changed. Things, things have, have changed. changed. Like, people think about the Lucy show as, like, really progressive, and she's, like, the first lady of comedy, and all these other things. And then watching the very first episode that you will see if you watch it streaming, and, like, that not being, like, a one-off joke, but kind of a plot point? Well, in a lot of ways, like, the, again, like, you, you gotta kind of reframe it a little bit. It's the idea that, like, 
what she's what she is writing into that episode, and like she is the like a showrunner on that show, like she is an influential part of that show, is like talking about the ways in which like men did actually treat women at the time. Like what that actually is is a historical record of what men used to do to women all the fucking time when they were like, oh, I don't want to deal with this woman tonight, so like I'm gonna drug her drink, or the idea that like I'm gonna do, I'm going to use. Is something out of her control in order to control her because I need to do a thing in my own life is legitimately something that women were dealing with on a regular basis back then and they weren't getting like they weren't getting any help with like like men could do this kind of shit uh, just carte blanche <laughs> right and the fact that it's like played for laughs and people probably thought it was hilarious at the time yeah. like it really just speaks to how different things are your baby it's cold outside thing perfect like one-to-one -one comparison there because yeah, I, yeah it's hard to it's hard to go through a holiday season and not like fall into that old argument for me and like and and again like like people t try and come up with reasons why it's not what i think it is but then like you see something like that where it's so friggin' on the nose it's just like i i like argue with that i don't know yeah, man. Yeah. yeah, 2020 2020 was one of those ones that kind of went out with a whimper for me because it was a lot of the same old bullshit as opposed to new bullshit. So, like, I, I guess you could say that that was kind of a win, right? Yeah, right. I mean, yeah, but you know what, Stadium? I gotta, I gotta stop you right there because this episode is good, but it could be better. <laughs> oh. And the only way that it could be better is if you tell me what you wish for in this world. <laughs> what do you wish for, Sajin? I mean, peace, love, and happiness for all of mankind and humankind. No, and... do not waste your wish on something like that. Oh, no. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I really do kind of want that Xbox so I can play Conquer again, but is that what we're no, talking about? No, it's your one wish. <laughs> Whatever. We're talking about Wonder Woman 84. <laughs> we're talking about Wonder Woman 84. The problem is, Sajin <laughs> watched <laughs> half an <laughs> hour. I was not going to give you my one wish, though. It's a monkey's paw. <laughs> CJ didn't watch it. I don't know if he got to any of the scenes that I referenced in that. I actually, I actually didn't, and I did not even get to Pedro Pascal, but anyway. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Uh, so Wonder Woman 84. Okay, so the first thing is, what is the title of this movie? Because I am convinced that it is WW84. I mean, it's Wonder Woman 84 is the way that I've heard you refer to with an apostrophe before 84, if you want to be technical and, about it. And, and yet on IMDb and HBO Max, it is Wonder Woman 1984. But in the movie, the title is WW84. The final end splash screen is WW84. And then the end of the credits is WW84. Like, that summons for me that same Beetlejuice of like, that's the title of your movie. Yeah, no, I, 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 no. I, as somebody that did, did not get through more than a half an hour of this film, I, I can understand that. Good, I'm glad I watched it twice and took 20 pages of notes. Because well, I'm glad you did too, because to. here's the thing, it's gonna get watched, like, let's not deny that. Yeah. But, like, let, like, cards on the table, like, let's talk about this. There was a couple of movies that came out for Christmas, Wonder Woman is clearly, like, the, one of the big ones we gotta talk about, and I wanted to be able to talk about it today. So my idea was that, like, I'm gonna watch it, right? And then some stuff started to come out about it, and and there was kind of an an oeuvre within the house that maybe it was not going to be something that was going to be watched by the family. This idea that, like, eh, like, <sighs> we'll watch it one day, but today's not the day. And it just never got watched. So I was like, well, I gotta watch this movie for the, for the show. So I put it on, like, last night, and I was like, I'm gonna lay down, I'm gonna watch a little bit of this, and, and, and then, you know, we'll be able to talk about it tomorrow. Uh, when I say a little bit of this, I do mean a tiniest bit of that because, like, man, I got like twenty some odd minutes into that movie, and I was just like, I don't really want to keep watching, which is impressive considering how much I loved the first one. And I had to stop right there. I was like, I need to stop. I need to watch this in a better mindset. And right now, this is not a good one, apparently. Dude, <laughs> so I don't I know I if doing. the proper mindset exists. Like that is where I watched the movie. We watched it I was on worried Christmas. About that. <laughs> Real we, worried about that. We watched it on Christmas Day. It was at uh, noon time. We're going to start this movie, uh, and now and when it's done, the turkey will be done, and we'll have watched the movie, and then it's time to eat because the movie is two and a half hours long. 
It is. It is fucking two and a half hours long. One of the first things I noticed as I hit play on HBO Max, I was like, oh, okay, we're strapping in. <laughs> this is a Godfather movie. This and is again, the length of the that, Godfather. Still at that moment where I was like, I really like the first one, so two and a half hours, like, I'm kind of looking forward to that idea. Okay, let's do this. I did not know it was two and a half hours. I avoided the runtime because I knew that if I knew it, it would be a problem. And then, like... We got a phone call or something happened, like, mid-movie that we had to pause it. And it's like, how is there 98 minutes left? How is there uh, still yeah. time? How was there that much movie left? Because, really, this feels like it's about to wrap up. It feels like <laughs> we've told the story. And if you watched, let's say, 22 minutes, really all you saw were the two action-packed opening scenes? Kind that, of action-packed opening scenes that were a little derpy, but yes, yes, those were the, basically the two that, Those are the I things saw. that you saw, and then we're like, this film's not for me, where that first day, when it was sight unseen, we didn't know what Wonder Woman 84 was going to be, uh, like, those things were exciting, like, it, it, it was like, if this is what this movie is going to be, awesome, but then, like... I watched it, and I didn't feel great about it. I felt like it had a lot of problems. And then I'm like, but I want to talk about it on the show. And if I'm going to talk about it on the show, I need to watch it again. I need to give it its due diligence. And maybe now knowing what I know, like there's a ton of movies that I that has benefited from a second viewing. Right? I, I can think of thousands of movies that the first time it didn't really jive with me. But then the second time, like, I got it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, like, you know, now that I know where it's going, like, that scene that feels like it's a waste of time isn't a waste of time. It's important. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah. And I probably should have stopped when the first the opening scene where she's a little baby Wonder Woman. She's a child. <laughs> That's the Breaking proper into the word. games. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and she's competing in Double Dare with the other Themyscarans. I thought of it as gas, but yes. The guts. <laughs> you thought of it as guts. There we go. Um, yeah, guts is probably the better option. Really, it was like a, a quintathlon, really, if we're if we're going to talk honestly. Um, and I'm like... Run up the waterfall, flip on the thing, slap the ball. <laughs> and go home with a glowing piece of our radical rock. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mike O'Malley. You're a treasure. I'm sorry I dragged you into this conversation. Um, rewatching that opening scene, I'm like, this, no bearing on the rest of the movie. None. Like, yeah. even the little lesson of, like, you can't take shortcuts, that's not really the lesson that, like, she needs to think back on in well, this movie. Is, that's the lesson that she needs to impart on other people, right? Because, like, that's the idea with, like, like, look, I, I wasn't stupid. I still did some research oh, on yeah, this movie. Oh, okay. yeah, So, like, so talking to the idea of, like, you can't just make wishes to make your shit come true, right? And I, I guess in a weird way she kind of learns that with Steve. But, like, like, the idea that, like, you can't take shortcuts is stretched real thin throughout the rest of the concept of this film. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things. Yeah, it's like the person who needs to learn this lesson is Pedro Pascal and Kristen Wiig and all right. these other people. So it's weird that we see her learning the lesson when she was a little kid. Yeah. Like, it, like that doesn't jive the way that I think you thought it was. And I oh, don't... Imagine if we saw, she, she, like... Like Kristen Wiig, sorry if I I, mean, I nope. keep wanting to call her just Cheetah. Is it Cheetara or am I it's, mixing it's, that up it's with Cheetah? Barbara it's Minerva Cheetah. is probably the best Barbara. way to record. Barbara okay, is probably Barbara, the best way. But imagine this movie opening up with with because we, we've already gotten some of Young Wonder Woman in the first movie. I think that's one of the big things for me is like as cool as it was to see more of the Amazons, and I always want to just see more of that. I I think this movie probably would have been more interesting to me if that opening if we saw a parallel to the opening with her in the first movie but with a different little girl, right? Like, like, and I, and I say specifically girl because in the idea of these being women empowerment films, which they, they both should be considered. And the idea that, like, we got to, if we got to see a parallel opening with Barbara as a child and, like, her becoming who she was, it would have been much more interesting to me and would have definitely kept me more compelled. Like, seeing some of this Amazon stuff honestly felt a little, like, like redundant compared to how awesome the beginning of the you know the first 40 minutes of Wonder Woman was for me. I mean the issue that I have with it is 
questions of Amazonian culture, of, of, well, really Themyscarian culture, because they're Amazons, mm-hmm. but specifically on the Isle of Themyscira. Um, yeah. I, it's they're supposed to be a race of warriors, so I was a little confused by like the people who were not warriors in the stands, like the it, idea it, that there were some people that I mean, like all cultures need all cultures class, need though, that right? type of stuff, but. It just seems so strange to me that I'm like, I had never considered that. And, like, that's something worth exploring. Is, <sighs> like, I, like, I, I... Yeah, and I think the best Wonder Woman stories kind of do. Like, if you really look yeah. at some of the stuff that happens with some of her sisters who don't... And I say sisters, not not literal sisters, but in the in the tribe. Like, when they, when they realize that they are not as strong as she is, they go the other route, which is usually something like magic. And that's what really fucks them up, is they usually end up in these really bad places because they try to get as good as her, but in different ways. And, and again, they, they try to cheat the system, essentially. And there is this weird idea that, like, like there is, like, <laughs> honestly, a lot of Wonder Woman stories, as I now think about it, deal with the idea of, like, no, 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 no. You're stepping outside of your class, hun. Like, you can't do that. <laughs> and it's like, oh, shit. Like, that's not great. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it really made me take a look at the whole Wonder Woman oeuvre, to use that yeah. word again, and be like, Th- these, I, I like her as a character, but th- I can't think of good villains that she but, can but, fight, because it's mostly not... just people trying to be like her, and... I don't know. Uh, for, I mean, for the best the best Wonder Woman stories have been her going up against like for me, and this is just me, is her going up against like Greek gods and stuff. So yeah. like like when she goes up against Zeus, that's when it's really interesting. Or when she, you know, like like that that's the that's the stuff that's really interesting to me when she when her when she is almost Herculean in her stories, right? Um, but that's that's here and there. I, I I think the big thing is is that the idea that that. If this stuff was the the kind of stuff that it wanted to call into question, the idea of I mean you know writ large like like as I said, it's hard to watch these movies and not think about them as like woman empowerment movies. If it was not the kind of thing where it was calling into question the idea that like certain feminist beliefs kind of force this like class nature on the idea of feminism and the idea of womanhood and the idea that like if you're not an Amazonian like warrior then what are you in our society like if it was calling that stuff into focus and like and saying like we should examine this and we should talk about this like like as as females like we need to we need to understand what it is we're saying to people when we say this is what a true female is it means we're saying this is what a true female is not as well. Like it's not it's not holding a mirror up to the idea of like womanhood or feminism in any way. As much as like as much as like it does it anyway, it never questions itself. <laughs> and like it's really weird to sit here and, and watch a movie that is supposed to be all about like look at how powerful this female figure is, but then at the same time also watch it put a bunch of other female characters into a weird like like box of like you're no good to me. It's like upsetting in a lot of ways yeah it thank you i'm glad that i'm the one feels that way okay so you saw the opening scene right yes i would like to i would like to address something that happens in that opening scene and that's the fact that robin wright steps in and stops her from finishing right i hate that i absolutely hate that because first of all you are interfering with all of the other competitors by stepping out onto the field to do that and it's just like it irks me in this way that I'm just like this this these games are not about Diana. There are other people here and the fact yeah. that you're just strolling through that upset me. But also as someone who has seen the lesson of you don't get to win if you didn't play by the rules as someone who's seen how that plays out in real life like it would have been better if she got to throw her little spear and then, like, have that moment of excitement thinking that she won and nobody cheers and then the other one is given the award. And then she's like, but I did it. And is like, no, 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 you cheated. You, did, you didn't yeah. do it right. Like, letting her finish, letting her think that she won and then explaining to her why she didn't that's the better way to teach that lesson. And it doesn't, you know, get in the way of the five other women who are competing in this contest. Yeah, again, I think it comes down to the fact that very specifically, 
this movie does not do a good enough job. And in fact, the first movie doesn't. Like, I'll even point to the first movie as as a fault as well. It doesn't do a good enough job making these women on this island characters. They are all just badass women. That is their character Mm -hmm. trait. And so there's no there's no complexity to it. So in this one, when they try and introduce complex moments like Robin Wright, like like stepping out and stopping her and, and, and be walking through the crowd and all this stuff, it's not meaningful. It's confusing because they are not they are not full fledged characters making a choice to do a thing. It is just it is it is entirely for the service of the story. They just become the objects of the plot at that point. MacGuffins like and it. It it is uh, yeah, and I think that that's part of it. What it was for me is like, I wasn't watching like the first movie. It felt like I was watching. I was getting to meet these people, and I was getting to learn who they were and what their different traits were. And the difference between Robin Wright Penn and and who plays her mom in that one, uh, I forget Connie the Britain. Connie Britton, right? Like like watching like the differences between these women and and how they interacted in the same society, holding the same beliefs but approaching them in different ways is like really complex and interesting and really develops them as like human beings. And this one you get none of that it is entirely just like i mean it's it's no different than watching fucking machismo on screen and watching like like fast and the furious and it's why i can't sit down and watch six fast and the furious movies in a row right and like and maybe knowing that maybe now i can go back in and watch wonder woman and enjoy it knowing like you were saying earlier knowing what i'm getting into but like having that kind of hit me in the face after the first one dealing with them as like complex different people was was a very jarring effect of like oh this is not the same movie that i want this is not the same world of which i watched a movie in three years ago four years ago right uh and also and this is gonna sound weird and i know that it's going to sound strange so like apologies right there uh this movie proves that ghostbusters answer the call could have existed in the same universe as ghostbusters without any fucking problems (laughs) because the whole world went to crazy wish Armageddon, like mm-hmm. on the brink of destruction, and everybody forgot about that by 2016. So, like, <laughs> it's completely believable. You said answer the call in Boston, where you shoot it, and everybody just thinks yeah, that whole thing that happened up in New York. You know, or rather, this movie kind of proves that no, you can't do it that way <laughs> because because now nobody in the audience has forgotten. <laughs> right, but I mean, world, but you don't, maybe, but, but you don't audience. bring it up. You don't, you don't say it like that. But it's just like one of those situations where like those guys show up and they're like, you would not believe what happened in New York in 1984, and it's just like, oh my god, it exists in the same world, and that's enough. Like, and these people just don't know about it because of Matt Walsh's character, who was apparently part of the real life MIB in the Ghostbuster universe. Like <laughs> it's just yeah. it's just so strange because the like, the world forgot about Wonder Woman when she yeah. she talked to all of them at once using magic Star Wars technology. Yeah. Well like I mean yeah, I, I'm I'm not gonna sit here and defend any of that shit. I think it's egregious the ways in which it kind of ignores the rest of the DCEU, which like kind of spits in the face of everything that's been going on, right? With with Warner Brothers. I mean, and more to the point, kind of proves that Warner Brothers has given up on trying to do an extended universe. Right. Um, but like the idea that the, the they we saw in Justice League the attempt at building that kind of story with like the weird Flash stuff or was that even was that Donna Justice where Flash like shows up randomly? Um, um no. <laughs> Batman v Superman. He, it's not the one where Flash shows up randomly. Batman like a... v Superman is the one where the other members of the Justice League show up in cool YouTube teaser trailers. But what's the one where Batman has the weird vision and Flash shows up in, like, a swirly gig? Like, and he realizes he has to go, like, find the other members of the of the Justice League. Is that V Superman or is that the beginning of Justice League? I think what that is is Suicide Squad. That <laughs> we we no, see... Yeah, no. no Batman, no. it's Ben Affleck oh. by himself, which we never see him in a fucking suit in Suicide okay, Squad. Okay, okay. So it's not him. Okay. It's him sitting in front of all of his fucking So it's like, Justice League. TVs. It's Justice League where I'm he realizes sure these Batman are the people. V Superman. I'm pretty sure it's Batman v Superman, but you can say I Justice think, League. I think, you have com- I think you have confused the two scenes where in Batman v Superman, he we get to... There's a 12-minute interlude in the middle where Batman is watching YouTube videos... About Aquaman and Cyborg and Flash and Wonder Woman, even though she's in that movie. 
No, no, no. And I'm then, not talking about the flashback. No, 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 no. We're not, we're not talking. I'm, let me finish because I think I figured it out. And then Flash shows up and he's the one who captures Captain Boomerang to let us know that Flash is, exists in the world. Yep, the Flash and Man, the Flash and <laughs> Batman v Superman. It is definitely a scene in in Batman v Superman where Flash shows up for like a second, coming out of like a swirly gig, and convinces Batman that he needs to stop what's coming. And he mistakes what he's supposed to stop what's coming for Superman, and that's why he starts the whole. Well, not starts, but he's already kind of hell bent on it. But he convinces that as Superman he has to stop. And what is really what Flash is talking about is Dark Side. I'm like looking at it right now. My God, why we I don't have, remember why we that at Flash all. Batman v Superman cameo. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. crazy. Exactly. That, that is, I've forgotten that. I remember yeah. the trailers that were wicked weird, like brought the movie to a screeching halt as we watched like cool videos about these characters that are going to be in the next movie and Wonder Woman who's already in this movie. Yeah. And then I definitely remember Flash catching Captain Boomerang and Suicide Squad and being like, that was weird. Because <laughs> yeah, like, so he, he's he nobody. Chose- yeah, he shows up in Batman v Superman. He shows up in a bunch of like in the moment where Bruce is looking through TV screens and then like falls asleep and like has the weird nightmare and then it ends with all this shit. Anyway, thank you for so, that picture. Uh, so, yeah, yes, so, I'm so he sorry. He shows up. And that's him in, the, in Batman v Superman. And so anyway, so he sorry. shows up and we saw them try and build that idea of a world. And people didn't know what the fuck to do with it because they just approached it this really fucking weird way of they're like, we're going to, because time travel's involved, we're going to lay crumbs now. But they didn't lay crumbs. They threw fucking loaves of bread into other movies. And they were like, eat this. And it was like, I, I don't I don't want to. I don't know what this is yet. <laughs> Sijin, I, I, I feel like I have blocked this memory from existing in my brain. I, I feel you, like I have done whatever I could to avoid this existing in my in my head because this is like what I'm talking about when I talk about how the whole DC universe has been a fucking mess and you're like but Justice League though and I'm like even Justice League wasn't good because the scenes you thought were in Justice League were actually in other movies oh my god I'm so terrified <laughs> I'm terrified like this oh my, is anything real <laughs> I mean, and this is what I mean. Like, like, so, so they they introduce this movie, and they're basically saying "fuck you" to the Zack Snyder idea of a DC connected universe because they're throwing it in the face of all of this shit that they have that they clearly paid attention to before and just don't anymore. Like, that's what makes it all the more egregious is the idea that in the past they have paid such attention to detail that they've actually laid things in earlier movies in order to talk about what's going to happen in later ones, and now they're doing the. T- total opposite where they're just completely negating things that have happened in other films meanwhile we're staring down the barrel of a potential like two or three part fucking justice league supercut on hbo max whatever that ends up being and people are convinced that that's going to tie it all together and save everything and then and then wonder woman 84 steps in and basically just like kills your hopes and dreams like no we're we're not doing that at all whatever they do in that that's going to be the end of it we're moving on from that is essentially what this does for everybody so on top of like what it does for you watching and being like oh i'm a fan and i don't understand how this works it also is kind of like this thing of just being like uh i'm a fan and i don't understand whether or not you want me to be invested anymore <laughs> yeah dude like i'm I, first of all i'm sorry for doubting you and for the conversation yeah. that we had <laughs> I I don't imagine I the Mandela effect uh, different universes co- coexisting on the say report right now. Like that's how weird this all feels to me. Berenstain, Berenstain, I I don't know. I, I <laughs> what what was it? Flintstones, Flintstones. It's crazy. Is, you, you you've really blown my brain. You've blown my mind. I I I'm sorry. Jesus. Whew. Yeah, so I guess Whatever. The conclusion is, I didn't like Wonder Woman 84, and then I thought on it, rewatched it, and I don't use this a lot for movies. I actively hate that movie. <laughs> I actively oh, hate man. that film. And I'm not happy about it. And, you know, like, it's just when it comes up in conversation or I think on it, I hate it. But I do want to give one shout out, and that's the fact that Stephen Trevor, right, he references the monkey's paw. And everybody knows what the monkey's paw is because of the Twilight Zone, or more accurately, The Simpsons. The Simpsons episode about the Twilight episode. But that is- Steve <laughs> Trevor had to have read the 1905 short story. And that impresses the fuck out of me. 
that this yeah. guy who was in World War One was also an avid reader in a time where, like, probably wasn't super easy to read. Yeah. I don't know, man. I the big the big thing that gets me, and I haven't even gotten to it yet, is the weird ways in which they introduce Steve, and like the fact that they basically have to ignore that he's taken over another human's life completely. Okay, so the the final summation of that film is, I made jokes all the time uh, during that movie, and every single joke that I made ended up being a significant plot point. Because I'm like, it's going to be like chances are, and he's going to take over somebody. And then that happened. And then, you know, I wish I could just reach out and touch someone, touch them all. And I sang the AT&T reach out and touch someone jingle. And then like, literally, that's what he does. <laughs> and I'm just like, this is, this is not fun. This is weird. And do you know what Patty Jenkins theme and message for this film was? Did you see that interview? No. It's about climate change. It's about climate change and that if we're going to fix it, we all need to work together. <laughs> what? And no, that's not what you presented on the screen at all. Mm, that's, it, that's it actually highlights the like real negative thing regarding climate change in the fact that we think that if I'm doing it, if I'm lowering my carbon footprint, that's going to be enough. But like, no, we need real systemic changes to our economic engine. If we're going to stop and curb the dangers of climate change, like one person is not enough because we've learned that. Over the last 30 years where we've tried to make people environmentally minded and things have only gotten worse because the people in charge refuse to adapt and change because it would ruin our economy. Jesus, my brain shut off as you were just saying that. Never mind watching a movie that's supposed to be about it. And I mean, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't talk about that. It's just very strange. It's all just very strange. And, you know, it's, it's whatever. I've watched really good movies that I have other stuff I want to talk about. And we will talk about those other movies in other episodes. But I, I'm fearful that they're going to show up with food soon. And I want to make sure I touch on some other things. <laughs> Yeah, um, no, no, man. Yeah. Wonder Woman 84. Uh, disappointing and a weird vision of the future, <laughs> which may or may not have appeared two years ago. <laughs> it probably happened in Batman v Superman that you got to see in your universe. Meanwhile, I just got YouTube videos. Was Martian Manhunter in this movie that you saw? Uh, no, which just makes it all the weirder that apparently he was entirely cut from the film and is just going to be re added in without adding any, without, without. <laughs> Subtracting it all from the experience, I mean. Oh, Let's my see. God. I can't wait. I just can't wait. All right. So, Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition on the PS5. It's fucking awesome. Nice. <laughs> I know that I I'm said glad. on the show, don't let me buy this game. Everybody in the world, don't let me buy this game. Dale bought the game for me for Christmas, and I played it today. And the best thing of all, right, the greatest love of all, is that you can play Virgil mode right from the beginning. You don't need to unlock it. It's not an unlockable after you finish the game as the Dante Nero V mode that for the original. On the front page, it is original Virgil. And I've been playing Virgil mode and it's incredible. <laughs> and it looks wow. beautiful. And I'm, I'm in love. I'm in love with the game all over again. And I'm glad that I waited until it was on PS5 to purchase it. Because, <laughs> you know, as hard as it is to get a PS5 right now, there aren't a lot of games for it. Yeah. So I'm okay with having this one game that can just absorb all of my time. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm glad to hear that it looks really good. I'm not surprised. And, like, I, in a lot of ways... Like, I'm surprised we didn't get, like, a Gran Turismo to go along with a PS5 launch, because that's usually, like, the the, like, the visual, like, mother load for, for PlayStation. And when we didn't get that, I was kind of trying to figure out exactly what they were going to kind of push as, like, their, like, their tech... Not not tech demo, that's not fair. Their tech demo but, like, is Astro's Playroom, and it's incredible. And it's <laughs> free with the system. 
but the but the idea that like this is the thing that's going to push it to its limits and show you what we know we can do with the current technology and like something about devil may cry kind of sings that to me that idea that they're like look this is what we can do between the controls and the visuals like we're gonna we're gonna give you the full experience of what the ps5 is truly capable of and i'm glad that it, it came out as well as it did because it had potential to just be just an, a like an up version of the of the four but i've heard nothing but good things about from people that love it so we do a podcast. I, I don't think I've made it any secret that I'm an audio guy. 3D audio on Devil May Cry 5 is so friggin' cool. Nice. <laughs> it is so cool that like a, 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 a ambulance is going off in the distance and it's to my left and then I turn around and I feel like I'm there as it like rotates with me turning until it's suddenly in my right ear. Like, it was so immersive and cool. Nice. Like, as good as the graphics are, like, the three, 3D audio is something that could potentially make gaming a whole new world. And that's awesome. Just, like, thumbs up for that. <laughs> Fucking rad. I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. Yeah. That's so cool. Transformers Earthrise, the second part of the War for Cybertron trilogy. <laughs> it came out on Netflix. Um, I'm going to do an episode of Bored with Friends like I did for the first one, but uh, the highlight is not very good. It's not very good. When you have six episodes of a TV show, maybe don't make two of those episodes filler that literally do nothing. <laughs> like that literally. <laughs> the whole reason you do six episodes <laughs> is because then you can just get right to the point. Like, like use those two episodes to introduce the villain who's in the second episode and then shows up in the last five minutes of the final episode. And you're just like, Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you're the bad guy. <laughs> I mean, is it like, is it empire style? Like, Oh, no. there's a lot going on that you need to know for the future. No, no, no. And, and like that, that there's literally no way that what happens at, in that episode will come back and have a meaningful impact on the show. <laughs> Okay. None. And it's just like, oh, okay. Like, wow. The only thing is I felt heard. I felt heard and I'm very excited about that because I lamented the fact that in a moment where Alita 1 was trying to appeal to the human side of Optimus Prime, not the warrior side of Optimus Prime, she didn't call him Orion. And Megatron is throwing around their pre-Transformer names all willy-nilly and it just made me so happy because it strengthened the fact that like these three people alita one optimus prime and megatron knew each other before they were at war with each other hmm. and like megatron for all the despicable like despotic things that he has done in the name of the decepticon cause still looks at these two people and sees his friends ariel and orion and like that that's like so hard for him to like try to come to terms with. Like that was the best part about it. And oh, did you know that Alita One's name before becoming a Transformer was Ariel? No, I had no idea. Yeah. So <laughs> like it's it's that's yeah, I mean like that's some cool world building. Yeah. And it but like it appealed to me as a fan of the show's de like the mythos and the continuity of Transformers. And like, yeah, and it and the, it added emotional weight to her response back to him is just because I knew you when you were a, were a hero doesn't mean I forgive that you're a monster. And it's like, yeah, that's the response when somebody like calls you by the name that you, you used to go by before you were at war with this person. Fucking rad. I mean, like, I'm glad that you found something worth it in it because it's it's a little disheartening to hear that it's not super cool. I mean, I know that they were like really hoping for like a, a dark, a more adult version of Transformers with this run, um, and that's always a a, a sticky wicket, as it were, <laughs> to try and do. Um, but uh, I mean, at least you found something. I honestly wonder if it was affected by like COVID and all that. And, like, trying to get it out the door despite the fact that everything was different. Like, it it, it just, it, fe it feels like it has those fingerprints on it, unfortunately. That, like, if we had a little bit more time, maybe we could have done what we wanted. Which is why I'm still 
oddly optimistic for the last one, if only because the final shot is Dinobot. So like Beast that Wars is coming. Oh man! For the final is... part. I mean, way to get me interested instantly. <laughs> Dude, well, like, so a raptor... Well, so first of all, they, they're they above the atmosphere of what we believe is Earth, right? Because it's called Earthrise. They never get to Earth in the series called Earthrise. And it looks like it's Earth because, you know, we, we know what Earth is supposed to look like based on space pictures of Earth. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, scientists. So, yeah. So it looks like... So it looks like Earth... And then, you know, the ship goes down and it's literally the opening of Beast Wars with the, the, the parts of the spaceship going through the atmosphere and burning up. And then a raptor steps out of, you know, a, a bush and you're like, oh, that kind of looks like Dinobot, but it could just be like a regular raptor, right? And it's just right. to let us know that it's prehistoric time. And he looks up and reflected in his eye is the falling debris of spaceships. And then... It fucking blinks, and then when it unblinks, it's robot eye. Nice. And I'm just like, that's incredible. Like that's amazing. Like and like that, and that was enough for me to be like, I'm gonna watch the third part. You sons of bitches, you wasted my time <laughs> with this. <laughs> the only thing that really makes me happy is that I, I get out, but they pull me back in. <laughs> right. Uh, th I'm using it. Fuck it. I'll talk about the other stuff. Other. I watched The Godfather Coda, The Death of Michael Corleone. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> um, I'm so happy that I pre-ordered it on Amazon in physical copy, including a digital copy. It ended up costing me ten dollars. Where if I had just bought it digitally, it would have been twenty dollars <laughs> because the price went down during the pre-order time. So they're like, "You saved money." Nice. Um, is good. Uh, especially. I mean, so I've always kind of been a fan of the Godfather Part Three. Uh, and only because the exploration of the Catholic Church as, like, the worst of the worst criminal organizations. Yeah, they're really being a part of all of it, and if not responsible for most of it, yes. So, like, that is what I highlight as, the like, when I talk about The Godfather Part 3 with people, and usually people are like, Ugh, right? And I'm like, you're not wrong, you're not wrong, but... That whole Catholic Church thing where, like, Michael thinks that it's going to be his way to redemption because to him there's no greater good in the world than the Catholic Church. And right. then him finding out that, no, 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 they're just as, if not more corrupt than what you've done with your entire life. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's no better. Like, you just have to be a good man. <laughs> you can't seek yeah, absolution yeah. from other people. Yeah, like, oddly enough, like, you, you tried to get away from the sins of man by running to this thing that, uh, unfortunately, is just made up of a bunch of other men is really, the, like, the, the driving force of that, for sure. Um, the, the edit, right, the major edit is that scene with him and the archbishop where he's like, I need $700 million in order to balance the Vatican's bank's books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um that instead of happening 40 minutes into the film is the first scene of the movie. Yeah. They cut like the first, they cut all of the like beef out of the front, right? Like they're yeah. just like, here's the, here, here's the fucking story guys. I mean, the yeah. crazy thing is that at the end of the day, this is two hours and 36 minutes long. And the original was two hours and 42 minutes. So like is really only six minutes changed, <laughs> but just by structuring it in a way that, like, this is actually what's important in this movie. We're going to present it to you in the first scene rather than 40 minutes in. Yeah. Like, it it really, like, I'm like, good. Because this is what I always tell people is why you need to watch The Godfather Part 3. Because is this is the interesting part. Is that, oh, you know, the Catholic, we've been stealing from the Vatican Bank and we're $700 million in the hole. We need to fix that. <laughs> Yeah, much more interesting story for sure. Yeah. Again, it's that thing. It, it hooks you in the first few minutes now in the way that it didn't originally. Yeah. And it's it's the biggest sin I think of the of Wonder Woman 84 is like it doesn't it just doesn't hook you fast enough I mean, with whatever it's trying to say. The real crazy thing about it not hooking you with what it's trying to say is that by opening with two large action set pieces, it kind of gives the impression that it's going to be kind of an action-filled movie. So then when it becomes a cerebral kind of talky drama <laughs> after that, you're yeah. kind of like, what happened? What happened to the action? Pieces? What happened to the yeah. action that I, I thought this movie was going to be? Because that's how you introduced yourself to me. Yeah. 
All right. Ooh. So uh, one other thing that I want to touch on, because I can't fucking believe it happened. Are you sitting down? You have to be sitting down, right? You don't record standing up, do you? I no longer record at my standing desk. I want to start again, but no. Alas. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's a good resolution for 2021 is yeah. to use your standing desk more. Um, so early on, right, uh, in the football season, we talked and we chortled and we changed the name of this podcast to the Rhode Island podcast in honor of the Washington football team. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And in that episode, I was like, I really want them to go all the way. But all of what we both thought, there's no way that that's going to ever fucking happen. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of my early birthday presents was that the Washington football team is the NFC East division champions. <laughs> <laughs> and next week they play against Tom Brady and his Buccaneers mm -hmm. in the playoffs. And Seijin, I have to tell you, <laughs> I want them to beat Tom Brady so badly. They could kick the Buccaneers' asses. I would be a happy boy. 2020, 2020, 21, 2021. Damn it. God, that's going to be a confusing gonna be, for a while. Yeah. 2021 is going to start off with a fucking bang. I am so happy. I, I mean, so, I mean, that's, we're going to watch it and we're going to report back next episode of the Say Report. But, like, I want it to happen. If if the team that like I'm rooting for because it looks like filler in the movie script ends up beating Tom Brady in his victory season with the Buccaneers, that mm -hmm. would that would warm my heart in a way that I can't even put into words. Like and I'm not even mad at Tom Brady for leaving New England. Like there are not people really. who are actually mad at him about it. Who like I hate Tom Brady and it's like that's weird because a year ago you like Asked him to be your godfather in a tw the godfather of your child in a tweet. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, man. So... I, I I am not I am not nearly as invested in this as some people are in the uh, in the Northeast. Let's put it that way. But like to find out that he lost to the Washington to the football Washington team. football team would be so good. I just. Fingers are crossed. I am rooting, rooting. Um, I, in addition to my my shirt that I bought just for the, the the lols, I got two Washington football team hats from different people for as Christmas gifts. Oh man! Because <laughs> they're like like you really seem to enjoy this. And I'm like I do. It's so do. hilarious really to me. <laughs> and like Thank if they, so the, well. <laughs> I mean, just the fact that they won the division could be enough for it to like have to be the name of the team for at least one more season. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, like, if they continue to do well and they win a Super Bowl, which, like, I know I'm counting my mutants before their X genes emerge, but if that were to happen, they would have to be the Washington football team forever into perpetuity mm -hmm. because they won a Super Bowl under that moniker. <laughs> We're rooting for you, boys. I if only for the memes. <laughs> if only for the memes. All right. Well, I just got the signal that food is here. And it felt like a, a natural stopping point anyway. Yeah. Uh, Seijin, is there anything that you want to add uh, before I, we send this one over to the vault? Uh, nothing huge. Um, we didn't get to address it at the time because the family kept it real quiet, but, uh, we found out on January, on uh, December 31st of all fucking days that, uh, MF Doom passed away back on October 31st, yeah. fucking two years earlier. Um, and two anybody months, that watched- Two months the, earlier. Yeah, anybody that watched Adult Swim uh, growing up in the 2000s was familiar with his work and the shit that he did with all of those guys. I have records of him singing with like Master Shake and shit like that. Like I, I, I just a uh, just a bummer to like lose him and, and to find out like months later. But obviously, like I, I totally understand why the family wanted privacy and and I think there's nothing better for for a dude like that, an underground rapper, than to find out months later that he's actually been dead for months and I've just been enjoying his music in the meantime. <laughs> I mean, like there, right there. Let's yeah. take that as like sort of a, a, a proof of humanity and compassion going forward into 2021 because like if we're able to still keep such like things private in a world where everything is out there like that's impressive that's an impressive yeah, thing like, for anybody that's not aware of who he was, um, the term that's getting thrown around a lot, and I totally think he earned it in his life, is he, he was a rapper's rapper. 
Um, so if you're at all into the, into just rap music in any way, or you know, like any type of of music that you're not going to hear on the radio, and I say alternative, but like anybody anybody knows an alt station. I don't mean that. I mean true alternative music. Like check him out. It's really like mellow vibes shit, and and he just. He had a way with words and a way with with the art form that made it truly an art form and was able to be like one of the best and most successful rappers while at the same time maintaining like an underground status that is just unfathomable con considering the, the the ways like Devin saying the ways in which the world nowadays kind of demands you be in the spotlight. Yeah. So rest in power, MF Doom from the Say Report. Yeah. Um, I'm uh, just gonna say you know it's 2021. We're we're rolling ahead. Let's let's keep our eyes bright and strong, healthy, and and just like powerful, ready to rock. I actually had something, but I've forgotten what I was going to say, which is disappointing because you made me a little sad remembering MF Doom. <laughs> Sorry, man. Uh, no, no, no. It's it's good. It's good. Um, because it, it is. It's one of those things that we we should remember and celebrate. And honestly, like that that his family was able to mourn, and because he, he was a, a semi public figure, like we should remember that they're just people too. Yeah. In, in a way. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. That, um, I mean, way too many end of the year videos with Kobe Bryant front and center on them. And it was just like, okay, like the dude deserves a little bit more respect than, than Google putting them in their commercial for 10 minutes. But anyway, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I forgot what I was going to say. And that's fine because this this is what this moment should be. Um, if you have anything that you would like to say to Seijin about 2020 or your hopes and dreams for 2021, you can find him on Twitter at Siege versus the World. Yeah, and if you want to hit Devin up with uh, with your resolutions for the year, you can find him at uh, Devin D. Decker. All right, so until next time, William, please bring us home. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your host Devin Decker and Seijin Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.